Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so over the last uh, 15 years, I've had um, dozens of titles, right? Um, I've been a trainer, I've been a program director, senior manager of global organizational development, uh, performance improvement consultant, structural consultant, uh, director of leadership development, and every time I got a new title on the new business cards, my dad would say, what do you do? And I would say, well, you know, I, I, I work with people uh, who have this kind of goal that they want to achieve. Um, I, I understand what they're looking for, I understand where they are today, and then I help them find a way to get there. And he would always say, well, isn't that what you did last time? And as I looked back on it, um, you know, this work that I've been doing has been the same work over and over again with all these different titles, with global nonprofit organizations, with Fortune 500 companies in the education sector, airlines, retail, small business, uh, <coughs> law. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I, I discovered uh, the work that Robert Fritz um, has discovered called Structural Dynamics that all of a sudden it came clear what that actually was. And um, in his first workshop, the, his introductory workshop called Fundamentals of Structural Thinking, he told a story about a consultant and a client going on a drive together and uh, the, the client was driving and every once in a while, the, the you know, 30 or 45 seconds, the, the client would take the steering wheel and jam it over to the right. And the consultant being, you know, really good consultant said, um, did you know that uh, the mission of the driver is to create an enjoyable and uh, effective experience for the rest of the people in the car? And the client kind of ignored him. Uh, and then, you know, every 30, 45 seconds, he kept jamming that wheel over to the right. And, you know, this consultant's top notch and um, said, did you know that uh, the desired state for you to achieve your mission? Hello. Um, the desired state in order for you to achieve your mission is to go in a straight line. And the client kind of shrugged him off, kept driving, but kept jamming that steering wheel over to the right. And, uh, you know, this consultant's very good, a lot of experience. The consultant said, did you know that best practices in order to go in a straight line would be to hold the steering wheel straight? And the client looked at him and said, listen, the car needs an alignment. If I hold the steering wheel straight, we're going to go off the side of the road. And no matter how hard this consultant tried changing the behavior of the individual, it didn't matter. It had no effect because the underlying structure that they were in wouldn't allow that behavior to change. And that's what Robert focuses on. That's the, the work that I've been studying with him uh, for the last several years. Um, and while I've stumbled across that uh, before working with him, the precision that he teaches us to do this with is remarkable. And I'm going to tell you kind of four principles uh, from structural dynamics. Uh, and then I'll share a couple of examples and stories how I've used it. And then I want you to understand how it feels to be in, in, in the structure. And that's where I'm going to need six to eight volunteers for a hula hoop exercise. Um, <laughs> so uh, first, um, and by the way, I'm a whiteboard guy. Thank you. Um, the first principle is that everything is a structure. The structure is the whole. Okay, so uh, your life has a structure that you operate within. A chair has a different structure than a race car. Yes? Okay, the organizations that I work in, they have a structure that kind of dictates behavior. And I'm not just talking about the organizational charts, um, but you know, the way that the underlying behaviors, the underlying principles, the beliefs, the aspirations, the norms, the rules that we play by dictate the behavior of the people in that structure. Okay, so the structure is the whole. Now within any structure, there is a phenomenon called tension. And tension seeks resolution. That's the base measure of structural dynamics, is tension resolution. So it's like taking a rubber band and stretching it. Okay, it, you create tension, that tension seeks to be resolved. 
And because of that principle, Steven Spielberg can create movies where you're sitting on the edge of your seat, right? He creates this tension, and you just, you're, you're waiting for it, and you're waiting for it to be resolved. That's how musicians can get you to get that hair to stand on the back of your neck, because you're waiting for it, right? And, and it resolves right at the last minute. So the whole principle is that you've got something, and it's seeking to be resolved. Hey, look at that. Thank you. OK, so that's the second principle. Third principle is that structures have more than one tension resolution system working on it at any one time. OK, let's take an a, uh, individual as an example, right? So um, if I'm hungry. That is the difference between the amount of food that my body has and the amount of food that my body needs. That creates this tension called hunger. How do I resolve it? You eat. Fantastic. Okay. Now, by the way, I know a lot of people, including myself, um, I've got this other tension resolution system called I'm overweight. Fat. Happens. So I have this other tension resolution system working here that tells me to do what? Diet or not eat. You wonder why it's complicated. Right? So here it is. We've got multiple tension resolution systems working at the same time. And this just happens to be an individual. But if you think about it, um, I teach leadership, right? Be bold, be daring, be abrupt, be a servant leader, humble. <laughs> Right, at the same time, right, organizations move as fast as you can but have quality. Okay, provide investment into the organization but provide a return to your investors at the same time. You've got multiple tension resolution systems working at the same time in a structure. And the fourth is that when you look at all the tension resolution systems happening in an industry, in a field, in a company, in an individual, the sum of them is creating a pattern, one of two. It's either oscillating, like a rocking chair. You push on that rocking chair, and it has a predictable outcome. What is it? It rock back towards you. Okay, you push on it harder, it's gonna rock back towards you. And it has this predictable pattern because of the underlying structure. If you take a car, I have a three-year-old son who's, who's in DC with us. He's got this you know, remote control car, and if I give that a push, it has a different structure than the rocking chair, what's going to happen to it? It's going to accelerate. So either the structure is oscillating back and forth, or it's accelerating or advancing. Okay? So in this example, look at this. I'm hungry, so I eat. Eating is causal to being overweight. So then I don't want to eat, but not eating causes hunger. That's what books are made out of, <laughs> right? So that's the principle. That's the basic. So let me share with you a little bit about um, some places that I've gotten to play with this. Um, first, currently, while I do a lot of work with different organizations, I'm employed full-time by Advance Auto Parts. Is anybody here familiar with Advance? Okay, we sell aftermarket auto parts. And between 2000 and 2006, they had had several CEOs. Um, they were opening about 60 stores and closing about 20. Uh, they were hovering around 2.5 million to, th sorry, billion to $3 billion in revenues. Um, they had about 44 to 47,000 employees and were hovering around an 18 to $20 stock price. And um, they were struggling. They're struggling trying to figure out, and they were in an organizational conflict. They were oscillating. See, here's what they were going through, okay? First, they had this desire to grow the company. Okay, they really wanted to grow and dominate the industry. So what do you do? You invest your money into the company. You hire people, you buy technology, you do all these things. But we also have these demands for stock owner, I'll just say ROI, return to the stock owner. So what do you do? You save your money and give it back to them. So the more we wanted to invest or grow, we started investing that money. We start investing the money, what happens to the stockholders? Who happens to be the boss of the CEO? They get mad and say, hey, whoa, 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 this is more important. 
So we start cutting and saying, no more jobs, no more stores, let's close some stores, let's do all this so that we can save our money. The stock price comes to a peak, right, where it can't grow anymore because we haven't been investing. And so what do we do? Oh, crap. <laughs> we got to start growing again. That's the more important thing. And you just end up in this cycle back and forth, back and forth. And so we have a new CEO, we have a new leadership team, a new group of folks that I get to work with every day who <coughs> recognize this from the beginning. And during some of our off time, I can talk about some of the things that we've done. But basically, we've said, look, we have a desired state of being able to grow and provide an ROI. Here's where we are today, all the stuff, all the measures. And what are we going to do about it? That's our new tension resolution system. And so today, just in comparison, um, we were investing, uh, opening about 60 stores, closing 20. Now we're opening and netting about 120 stores a year that we're opening. Uh, we were doing about $3 billion, $3 billion in revenue. We're doing about $5.6 billion in revenue. Um, we had 47,000 employees we're investing. We have got about 51,000 employees right now. And we just hit a $61 stock price. We were able to accomplish both of these things by incorporating them into the same desired state versus them being two different stories that were being put on us at the same time. Okay? Um, there's a lot of examples um, that I've had a chance to work with where I ha was able to do that. Um, I was working with the United Way. Anybody here work with the United Way or give to the United Way? Okay, so the United Way has this, this same uh, kind of dilemma going on where they said, you know what? We have this goal of maximizing the number of kids that we serve. Yeah? More kids need help. Okay, so what do we do? We distribute the money very broadly. Okay, more kids, the easier it is to raise money, right? Bigger the problem, the more, the more goal, you know, the more people care about it, we can get more money. We also have this goal of eliminating um, lack of kindergarten readiness. So kids who are showing up to kindergarten, we want them to show up ready to learn, right? Well, doing that narrows what we're going to choose to invest in. And guess what? If more kids are coming to school ready to learn, what does that do to the total number of kids that we can serve in that need? The goal is to eliminate the number of kids, to make it less and less every year. If it's less and less of a problem every year, it gets harder and harder to do what? Raise the money. So this is the structure that they're living in. And uh, it's a very emotional <laughs> structure for, for people to live in. And uh, I can share several other stories. We can talk about how it applies to the field. Can I do the hula hoop? 